enjoyed the company of my peeps and came back. Um, work continues to be busy. It's something we're working on and I believe we're making good progress. And so I'm looking forward to the end of what we are looking for. And I'm trusting that it will give us the results we want. Um, I'm currently reading Colossians. Actually, I finished the book of Colossians today. And uh, it's like I'd never read it before. I found it very, very insightful in the pre preeminence of Christ. I mean, there's a portion I wanted to read to us before I get into the devotion. Let me just find it. Just give me a second. Uh, just wait, just wait. Uh, let me see. Uh, yes, this is the part. Colossians chapter 2. Uh, let me start from verse 6. It says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Let me step backwards. Let me read it from chapter 1. Verse 1 of Colossians. What a great conflict I have for you and those in Odyssey, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see you good, to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He says, as you therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. This is what Paul is telling the Colossians, that as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him. So walk in him, make sure you are rooted and built up in him, and you are established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And he says in verse 5, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Paul is cautioning us not to be deceived. We need to beware because there are people who can deceive us. And he says he doesn't want to persuade us with words. Paul was preaching Christ. I was listening to a sermon yesterday, Rima Fist Kakamega, and, and Bishop Masinde was saying, said something that struck me, that when Paul went to Athens, he found the philosophers, he found the people debating, and he got caught up in debate. And it's very sad that because Paul debated, he did not preach Christ. Today, there's, he did not establish a church to, in Athens. He had established churches in all other cities he went to, but he wasn't able to establish one in Athens because Paul went with the wisdom of men. And so I just want to challenge us even now as we continue the series that I began before last week, that as Christians, we need to propagate Christ. Christ is the center of our message. And, and that's the point I want to emphasize that the last words of Jesus Christ should always be our first concern. That's the point I want to help make sure that we all know that the last words of Jesus Christ should always be our first concern. I want us to pray even as we start tonight. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this opportunity to be called the sons of God. We thank you for the privilege of meeting together as brethren. Your word says that where two or three are gathered in your name, you shall be in their midst. And Lord, we want to acknowledge your presence here with us. Thank you for gathering us. We thank you for everyone that's on the call. 
We pray, Lord, that you will give us stable networks, that, Lord, we'll be able to sustain the call. We pray for our friends who not be able to join. Remind those who wanted to join and have forgotten that, Lord, everyone that needs to be part of us tonight shall join us. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Thank you all for coming and welcome those who have not been with us before. Um, I hope you are blessed last week um, with Reverend Ashaye. I invited him. I thought I would get him to do a series, uh, but his time could not allow. So I, we agreed that he could just give us a one shot. I want to encourage those of you who missed it, or even if you did, to listen to the recording again. And understand, the, the thing that I like the most about it is I've had the, the messages of the seven mountains of influence, but what struck me most is the hills. He brought in the concept of hills because there's no mountain that doesn't have hills. You need to, you need to scale the hills before you get to the mountain peak. Some even have ranges. So that for me was one perspective I had not thought about. But the other thing that st struck me as well was he gave it an African context. The Seven Mountains, the former one by Eddie Long. It's Ed, Ed Long, that's his name. Um, Eglon, I can't remember how they pronounce his surname, but he, it, it's really more like an American or the US mountains of influence. And I just like the peculiarity that he brought out for Africa. And I want to encourage us to read, to re-listen to that message so that you can get your own context and um, identify which mountain it is that you want to start scaling and continue from there. Let me encourage you to share the link with some of our friends that have not yet joined and would like to be part of us tonight. So we, we I introduced a theme last week, but one, um, communicating the gospel to the majority. And I gave us an inter, in, in introductory session, but I want to take us back a bit because I realized I needed to have started properly by first of all, giving us the biblical mandate for evangelizing. The point I wanted to make is when we did the series on the basics of our faith, we then covered the spiritual, what we need to, this, the, we, we then talked about the, the attributes, the spiritual attributes that we need to have. And we concluded by Jesus's model. And Jesus's model was for us to go and win people to Christ, build people in Christ, and send people for Christ, obeying his last words. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says, teaching them what you've observed. And he says, lo, I will be with you to the end of the age. The last words of Jesus Christ to Mount Olives was instructing the disciples to go and make other disciples. And he tells them before that in, to wait for him in Jerusalem until he sends them power, the Holy Spirit, so that they can become witnesses. And I, I, I brought to us the difference between believers and disciples. A believer is somebody who has accepted John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus was speaking to the believers and he told them, if you abide in my word, you shall become my disciple indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So a believer is the birth, somebody who is born again, who's believed in his heart and confessed with his mouth that Jesus is Lord. He becomes born again. He becomes a believer, gets born. And like newborn babes, that baby has to crave the word of God as milk. And I challenge us that every believer must be feeding their spirits with God's word. God's word is bread, it's food for the soul. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the Lord's mouth. So every believer must feed their spirits on God's word. The second thing you must is be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God in us that gives us the desire and the ability to obey God's word. 
we must be filled end of the age we cannot live this christian life in our own strength the reason why many christians are struggling to live their christian life is because they are doing it with their own ability the bible says let he who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall you can't do this life by yourself you need to be filled and to be filled means you must be full filled means to the brim the holy spirit has to consume you because your body is a battleground between the spirit world and the physical world we are a body we are spirit in a body that has a soul your body is connects to the physical world your spirit connects to the spiritual world in between is the soul and the battle of your mind your emotions and your will is depending on who is feeding you the spirit feeds on god's word the world feeds you with lies your body is feeding on things that this this the devil uses the world the physical body to try and persuade you to do to to live by your sin nature the nature that we acquired because of being descendants of adam the fallen nature when we get born again we acquire a new nature which new nature is what needs to be fed on god's word i'm giving you a speed summary of where we're coming from so that when i get where i'm going here with me so we are two natures we've got a, a sinful nature which is how we were because of our fallenness from from adam but when we get born again we us new nature comes that new nature needs the spirit of god and it needs the word of god so we have to feed our spirits so that we can start to gratify our spiritual nature and and suffocate the sinful nature that's the transition as you feed your word use of god's word the believer becomes a disciple that is to so you got won to christ you get built in christ then you need to go and win you go to be sent to win other people to christ so that is what i believe everyone on this call who is a believer should start feeding their souls of the spirit of god so they can become uh, esther please kindly mute they can become disciples and as a disciple you need to go out and start winning souls to christ so today i want to like i said i'm taking us back and i want to make a case i want to convince you to why evangelizing is a personal obligation so that we can all passionately engage in this urgent task evangelism or winning people for christ is not for certain people we have labeled evangelists the bible says the spirit of god will come and fill you to become a witness a witness of christ so i want to hope that we'll be able to define what evangelism is and identify the key features of the missionary god of the bible so who is god and what is evangelism is what i want to start us with there's a guy called oswald smith who said any church that is not seriously involved in helping fulfill the great commission has for forfeited its biblical right to exist a church here is a body of believers ecclesia any body of believers that is not seriously involved in helping fulfill the great commission has forfeited its biblical right to exist i want to ask us who is god from your own perspective who is god and i want to give you some answers god is self existent god is infinite god is incomprehensible god is love god is trinity god is one god is eternal god is omnipresent he's omnipotent god is omni he's he's omnipresent god is holy god is a spirit god is righteous god is faith there are many scriptures i can give you on that in the old testament there are several names that they give of god they call god elohim referencing god's power and his might his god he's also called adonai as lord referencing his lordship of god the lordship of god he's jehovah yahweh re referencing god's divine salvation 
He's Jehovah Tsekenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shama, the Lord who is present. Jehovah Makadesh Shem, the Lord thy sanctifier. El Shaddai, God of the mountains, almighty. El Roy, the strong one who sees. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. El Olam, the everlasting one. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. All these names of God were people's expression of how God presented himself to them. And so I want you to learn the names of God so that you can speak back to him what he is to you in your different circumstances. That is the God of the Bible. I want to make a point here that God, the God of the Bible, is not the same God as Allah, the Muslims believe in. I know for some of you who did CRE in Uganda, we had the either or part of the exams. And sometimes the or was easier. They would ask very simple Islamic questions. But Allah as, is not the God of the Bible. And I'll explain this a bit more when we discuss that topic that I had introduced last week. So I want to go and move. What I want to talk about the missionary nature of God. God's mission is to bring salvation to the world. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but is long suffering towards us, not purposing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. The reason why Christ has not yet come is not because he's not in a hurry. He's being patient concerning his promise because he doesn't want anyone to perish. God so loved the world. Everybody in the world, God loved, and he sent his son to die for every single individual. There's nobody who is not covered by the death that Christ died. And that's why it's unfair for us who know that Christ has died for every human being, not give them an opportunity to know that there is a free gift of salvation, eternal life, by only believing. The best thing about Christianity, friends, it is free of charge. Uh, having lived in the Middle East, and I see the amount of effort Muslims have to go through to, to live their life as faithful. It is extremely daunting. I shared with us about my colleague who was fasting for his dead cousin. Because his cousin died, they're trying to, to do things to push him into, into heaven. The Bible is clear. It says it's appointed for man once to die, then judgment. So we know that when somebody dies, friends, that is it. There is no purgatory, there's no inter, there's no place in between. The Bible says those who die without Christ have already been condemned. That is the truth, the sad truth. And since we know this truth, friends, we need to have a burden for people who do not know that if they die and they are not yet in Christ, the Bible says they have completely lost. So God. The, God's mission is to bring salvation to the world. When Christ died, the Bible says he went to the bottom, the middle of the pit, and he preached to the souls of those who had died before him. And the Bible said dead men were seen on the streets. And then he went up to get coronated. So all the people who lived before Christ had a chance to be preached to by Christ in hell. And it's my brother who normally says, there's no one who didn't have gotten saved if you're in hell and Jesus comes to preach to you. Why won't you respond to that altar call? And so those who died before Christ, he went to them. Everybody who has come after him, the Bible says those that know the law, are under the law, shall be judged by the law. Those who are outside the law shall be judged besides the law because in everyone's conscience, there's a law that is written. So for the people who have not had a chance to hear the gospel as we know it, God has put in them a conscience that has God's principles. 
that they can use to know right from wrong. But everybody who has had a chance to hear about Christ is going to be measured against how they responded to that commission, that call. So God's mission is to bring salvation to the world. There's the Latin word that means mission comes from a Latin word that is missio dei, which is translated the sending of God. So mission is the sending of God. That's the root word of mission. When you, when you say I'm going for a mission, a mission, the original meaning of that word is the sending of God. I know we now use it for any activity we're going out to do. I'm going for a mission, but mission, mission, mission is the sending of God. It is the essence. It, it's, it's an essence derived from the very nature of God. All missionary initiatives come from the heart of God. Therefore, it's also termed Axio Dei, which is the action of God. So mission, Monsieur Dei, is equivalent to Axio Dei, which is the, mission, the sending of God is from his heart. God is the initiator of his mission to redeem all peoples of this world. God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross so that the world could be redeemed through I want to ask somebody to mute. I'm competing with some sound. Uh, Bethel, stand in. Thank you. But this is how sensitive started. Sensitive was in the Bethel. This is how it started, sensitive. Brother, please kindly mute. Bethwell, Bethwell, please kindly mute. Oh, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Bethwell. Yeah, so I was telling you that so God is the initiator of, of, of mission to redeem all peoples of the world. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that he could redeem through the shedding of that precious blood. Therefore, after and after Jesus... Jesus then sent his disciples into the world for the same purpose. So God sent Jesus, Jesus sent the disciples, and the disciples came and they asked us to do the same through their right. So mission is not an activity of our church. It's an attribute of God. When you are doing mission, you are actually doing an attribute of God. So since the disobedience and the rebellion of humanity through Adam, God has been active in calling people back to himself. The moment Adam ate the fruit, the Bible says he got naked and they hid. And so when God was walking the cool of the day, he said, Adam, where are you? That was his first action of mission. Adam, where are you? His love for them was so great that he promises mankind a savior in the same chapter. Adam fell in Genesis chapter one, chapter three, between verses one to about four. That's when Eve is deceived and she ate and shared with Adam. In verse 15, God promises that there'll be enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. If you look at your Bible, that Genesis 13, 15, that seed of the woman is with a capital S. That is God's first prophecy of Jesus. The seed of the woman will crush, will, the, the seed of the serpent shall bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. God's love is so awesome that he still first clothes them before he expels them from the garden. After he has rebuked Adam, rebuked Eve, rebuked the serpent, he then killed an animal and covered them with skin. That's why the practice of slaughtering animals for sin and the scripture that says there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood came out of that action because God shed blood to cover the nakedness of man. So God's love is so awesome that he still first clothed Adam before he sent them out of the garden. God created the whole universe through Jesus and for Jesus. That's in Colossians 1.16. I also read that this morning. The world was created by, G, by G, let me just read it, Colossians chapter 1. Let me just read that out for you because it's very, very profound. Because sometimes people don't understand the, 
the preeminence of Christ. They think Christ is, is, is a Christian creation. But it says, um, for verse 16, it says, for this reason, we also, since, let me pick it from here. Verse 16, it says, he is describing Jesus for verse, uh, let, me, let me pick it from verse 12. No, from verse, verse 13. He, he, was, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He says, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, verse 16, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. God created the world, the whole universe, through Jesus and for Jesus. And yet his love for humanity was so great that he would then send his prized possession the owner of the universe, his son, to leave the glory of heaven, to come and die for the wicked, rebellious people. Through the son, God dis decided to bring the whole universe back to himself and bring about reconciliation between human beings and himself. God taking on a human nature in Jesus Christ became the center of God's missional purpose. So to this end, the human race is set free from the power of sin and death. The worst thing that can happen to a human being is death. The Bible says, in the day you sin, you shall die. But Jesus had to conquer sin and death, the two greatest enemies of humanity. That's why if Christ did not die and rise again, Paul says we are dead in our sins. So the most important truth is that Christ died. Because if he did not die, he cannot have resurrected. So the Muslims tell us that Christ did not die, that God put a wrong a face of Jesus on Barabbas and they crucified the wrong person. So God did not crucify Christ because that is the most important thing about Christ is that he died and rose again so that he reversed the power of death. And because they, that's what they call him the firstborn, because Christ rose from the dead, the Bible says those who die in Christ, when the last trumpet sounds, shall rise up fast. And then those who are living shall be changed. So Christ died and he rose up again to conquer the power of sin and death. This is evidence that God is integrally and personally involved in his missional plan. For by the disobedience of one man, the Bible says, Romans 5, 19, for the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. Because of Adam's sin, all human beings, every, even a child who's born today, you don't need to teach him how to do wrong things. He's already sinful. One man's disobedience made many sinners. So also through the obedience of one man, Jesus, many, in fact, the Bible says many more, will be made righteous. The power of his grace is stronger than the power of sin. That means if the fact that one Adam has made all human beings sinful, God's grace is stronger than that, which means, that's what the Bible says, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing, no power, no hardship, no treasure, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. I know some of us think, and. Many people think you can lose your faith. It is actually harder to lose your faith than we make it out to be. It's harder to, to stop sinning than to, start to, to lose your salvation when you have it. God's love is greater than the power of sin. So if one man's disobedience made many sinners, his obedience even much more makes many righteous. That's why the Bible says Jesus is the, is the right, we become 
the righteousness of God in Christ. Because in our own ability, we can never be good enough. That's what the Bible says. Our, our righteousness is like filthy rags. You can't be good enough. When God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments, they couldn't keep them. And the Bible says if you fail in one, you fail in all. It was impossible for anybody to fulfill the Ten Commandments. And that's why when Jesus came, Jesus fulfilled them all, and the Bible says he nailed them on the cross. He made a public spectacle of them, and then he said, that is it. That's when the tent, the, the curtain that divided the Holy of Holies from the, whole, the, the temple, the Bible says was cut from top to bottom to illustrate that it was actually a divine hand that, separate, that cuts and says there is therefore now no other mediator between, between God and men except his son, Jesus Christ. I'm trying to emphasize the, the point that it's God who is at the center of the mission work of creating salvation for humanity. God, in the story of creation, Genesis chapter 1, everything he created from day 1 up to day 6, he said it was good. And after as he spoke and things were created, the sun, the moon, the stars, the plants, the the sky, the, the ground, the rivers, the lakes, everything said it was good. After he's created everything, he says, let's now make man in our own image. He did not speak man, he made man. He picked soil and breathed into it and made man. And he said man will have dominion over everything. His precious person. Then he caused all the animals to come before Adam. And the Bible says none was suitable for him. And he put him to sleep. And out of him, he got a rib and created woman. And she says, this is born of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And he called a woman. That perfect couple, God has given dominion over everything. Then the devil comes and deceives them. But because God loved them, he immediately said, I'll solve this problem. And he prophesied the coming of Christ. Friends, God is the author of his mission. And so I'm trying to make a case to you, friends, that this mission that God started by sending Christ, Christ came and sent the disciples. He told the disciples, I will follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He saw what they were doing with the fish. After they were catching this fish, he said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And when he was leaving, he told them to go and make disciples of all nations. All nations, says, beginning from Jerusalem to Samaria to Judea to the uttermost parts of the earth. And we know that the disciples went out. We know that it was Philip who witnessed the eunuch who brought salvation to Africa. We know Thomas went to India, he did obey the last words of Jesus Christ. The challenge is me and you on this call who have received this salvation. What are we doing about it? We are going about our day aware that the people around us are not aware that Christ has given them a free gift. The Bible says that, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. It's a free gift. The only thing you do with the gift is to receive. That's what the Bible says. If you believe and receive and you confess with your mouth, you shall become saved. You'll be born again. So that is the disobedience of one man that made many sinners. Through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. That's the comparison between Adam and Jesus. Adam made all of us disobedient because of Christ's obedience. Whoever believes will be made righteous. You just need to believe so it's like you're in jail and somebody comes and pays your bail. If you believe your bail has been paid, you get out free. If you don't, you will stay in that jail. So what are some of the other Old Testament images of God? I just want to speak about what else the Old Testament think about God. Among the many images of God, there's a remarkable theme that the biblical God cares passionately about the total welfare of human beings. God loves us. 
the point I'm trying to make, God loves us. I, I don't know whether my point is coming through, but I want us to know that God loves human beings. I know many people sit down and ask that if God really loves us, how come there's so much wickedness? There's so much, all these things that we see happen around us. The two things that came from the disobedience of Adam, Adam ate the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. And God said, the day you eat of that fruit, you shall die. So two things that we get from Adam, in case you didn't know, is one, we get death. But the second thing we get is choice. So a lot of the wickedness you see happening is because people have chosen it. And so God has exalted his word above his name. The Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's word shall not return, shall not pass away. So because God said that if you, if you, you, his word says that you have the right to choose between good and evil, you will always have to make a choice. That's why Joshua at some point had to tell his, the Jews, choose you this day whom you'll serve. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. So it is a choice is one of the consequences of the sinful nature. We received death, but received choice. And that's why you have to choose for yourself. That's the Bible says, you have to believe in your heart, confess with your mouth to be saved. You can't get it by blood transfusion. I can't pray you into salvation. You have to confess it for yourself. So God, so God is, so some of the images of God is, they know God of creation. I don't think I've shared this with you, but they say that Chinese history, Chinese medicine actually, Chinese medicine boasts to have existed for over 5,000 years. So in some ways, Chinese medicine is actually older than Christ. But I want to surprise you, friends. In the Chinese language, Chinese write in pictures, their picture of creation is a man walking which means the Chinese who today are communists and don't believe in Christ, their picture word for creation is a man walking, which means they acknowledge the account of Genesis chapter one, that God created man, an adult. I know people have asked, and this is where science is, 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 is confused. In science, they, there's something they call carbon dating. Carbon dating is to try, they assume that everything, Thing starts from nothing to become what it is. So if Adam was made a grown-up man, and you're trying to count how old Adam is, the Bible actually counts Adam's age and says Adam lived for 930 years. But it counts him from the day he was created, not the day he was born. Because science assumes that every person is born from a cell. So if you found a candle burning, and you measured the rate of a candle burning. The question is how tall was that candle when it started burning? Because science assumes that it must have been very tall and it has been shortening over time because the rate of burning is whatever it is. But, but we know that that candle started at one, it was one meter tall. So science, carbon dating assumes that everything starts from zero. So you, 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 you try and get the half-life to, to determine how old something is. I'm just trying to make a point that the earth was created mature. So you cannot use the age of the rocks to determine how long the earth has lived. That's why there's a confusion about how long the earth is. Is the earth millions of years or is it thousands of years? If you go by the biblical account, the earth has only existed for slightly over 6,000 years. But when you use carbon dating, you're talking about the age of an old rock. But Adam was made a man. Eve was also made a woman. She was not a baby first to grow up into an adult. Sorry, I've digressed, but I'm just trying to explain that the Chinese word for creation is a man walking. They're acknowledging that God created man. The other word in Chinese, you can Google this actually, is the, their word for vessel, for boat. A boat in Chinese is a vessel with eight mouths. It's acknowledging the Noah's Ark. That was a boat is a vessel that has eight mouths. The Noah's Ark was the first boat that was ever created. So Chinese acknowledge the account of creation and the Ark, the story of Noah. If those two stories hold, 
we know that the writer of Genesis to Deuteronomy is Moses. The Bible tells us in Acts that Moses was learned in the wisdom and knowledge of Egypt. And I believe God educated Moses. He was being groomed to become a, a pharaoh, a prince. But that knowledge was so that he would be given the custody of the law, the word of God, the five books of the Old Testament, which is the entire Bible of the Jews today. So God equipped, so Moses is then who wrote God, I believe in those 40 days and 40 nights that he was in the mountain, God narrated to him how it was at the beginning. So Moses writes the account of Genesis in, at the time of Exodus, when this is way after Abraham, way after Moses, well, rather after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because remember, Moses was a descendant of Levi, who is one of the 12 sons. He's, so I'm just trying to show you that if the account of creation and the ark is true, that whole story of the first five books of the Bible are also true. I'm just trying to make a point that the Bible can be trusted. So God of creation, God of the Exodus, he was the liberator and he was a passionate God. God was so determined to get the children of Israel out of slavery to a promised land. God is a God of covenant and the law. He was an advocate for the poor and an advocate for justice. If you look at the laws in, in Numbers and Leviticus, he was advocating for the poor and advocating for justice. He's the God of prophets, if you look at the Old Testament. God was just in social relationships, justice for political leaders social morality and with worship the old testament has the old, old testament's perspective of god all mission is god's mission it, it it acknowledges that god is love is is the loving creator and the lord of creation he's the god of all nations god has a concern for all the nations and he promises the messiah He's the one who elected Israel and he called Abraham to become a blessing to all nations. His purpose, his purpose was to be a light to the nations, the deliverance to them is there so that they will shine and reveal the nations to the one true God. I want to finish today's lesson by just talking about mission. Mission has got, mission can be described as centripetal or centrifugal. If you remember your physics, Today, I've used a lot of science in my, my discussion. So centripetal forces, if you had a circle, the force that causes things to come towards, if you held a bucket with water and you swung it, that water will not pour at a certain speed because there's a force that is preventing the water inside from coming out. But also, if you held a child by the two hands and you spin them round, that child will not run. If you hold him, He's that there's a force that forces him to come towards you so that you don't lose him. So the mission has got both towards the center and from the center. In the Old Testament, the direction of was a lot of mission was to bring people into the center, bring them to the temple, bring them into the family. But in the New Testament, a lot of the mission is to take it out, go and tell people, go and bring people, go and go out and win people to Christ. So the concept of mission in the Old Testament was very much centripetal towards the center, moving from the circumference towards the center. The temple was the center and God's people came from the outskirts inwards to worship and to serve him. But in the New Testament, it's both centripetal and centrifugal. In some cases, God was sending Jesus into the world. Then Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus told his disciples that they too are the light and must shine before men. Jesus went everywhere preaching and casting out demons. That was going out. He sent the 12 and the 70. He gave the great commission. He talked about the mustard seed, the sower, the shepherd on the ship. Peter, Paul, and the early church were all going out. So I want to bring tonight's lesson to an end. By just challenging us, friends, to understand that mission is right from the heart of God. God is the author of mission. And so when we are doing mission work, we are simply being 
in the very nature of God. God is delay, is not slack. He's desirous that no one should perish. Friends, if you know anybody who hasn't accepted the free gift of salvation, you're not being fair to them. And so I want to challenge us as I finish that mission, the sending of God is an attribute of God. God is the author of mission. And so I want us to understand that we all have a personal obligation to be missionaries, to be sent, to go and tell people about the saving grace that we have experienced. May God bless you.